Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is PJ Singh. Um, at this, uh, I would like to thank Senthil and the Southeast Children and Elbow Group uh, for giving me the opportunity to um, talk about um, imaging in children. Um, as you all, I'm part of the organizing committee, and it would have been great to see you all face to face, but uh, we are where we are. Um, no disclosures related to this talk. So why do we need to do imaging? Uh, first, it's important to look at the diagnosis, and which may help us to decide whether the patient needs a surgery or not. Secondly, uh, once you've made the decision uh, for surgery, it helps you to take a proper informed consent explaining the recovery and the rehab uh, following this. It also helps uh, planning of the procedure, i.e. any equipment needed, uh, what to anticipate um, when performing the procedure. And of course, uh, although not very important, but relevant on the day to day, is the planning of the list. If you've got uh, a number of cases, then you may wish to arrange it appropriately, depending on what you're planning to do and what approach one is going to use. Next question is what imaging modality? I think it depends on what is the likely diagnosis and perhaps the initial treatment if you're seeing the patient for the first time. The cost, I find it quite frustrating when people just order investigations without having thought about the diagnosis. Is the availability of the investigation access? The expertise available to um, either perform that test or interpret um, uh, the data. So if you're ordering any tests, I think you must be able to interpret plain radiographs. Also see what the MRI sequences show, as I will show you through various steps. Should be able to make some interpretation of the CT, um, certainly looking at defects and bone loss and things like that. Should be able to understand and interpret the ultrasound report. And I think it's very important to order those investigations that would affect patient management rather than ordering it for the sake of it. So the common conditions that we see, broad groups, again, you know, there's always variations. Under 30, commonly instability, a slap lesion or a biceps lesion, and an internal impingement. 30 to 60 is mainly the rotator cuff pathologies, can have slap and biceps lesion, and occasionally, yes, you may get in degenerative changes. In the over 60s, again, a uh, rotator cuff problem is um, more of a common theme, uh, mainly to cuff tear or cuff tear arthropathy. Osteoarthritic changes as well in this age group. Let's look at some plain radiographs. So this is an AP view, a normal AP view. If you order one, this is what you will get to see. Uh, what it shows is a good view of the AC joint. You can see the two edges. Uh, a good view of the subacromial space. But what it doesn't show is a good view of the glenohumeral joint because there is overlap. The coracoid as well comes overlapping onto it. This is an AP view in the scapular plane, uh, which shows a good view of the glenohumeral joint. The coracoid uh, uh, appears more like a circle. There is poor view of the ACJ because it overlaps, and also shows a good view of the subacromial space. So just for comparison, the two views, uh, you can see on the PA view, um, on the AP view of the shoulder and the AP view in the scapular plane, the difference in the two is there to be appreciated. The next step is to the difference with the external rotation. So the one on the left, this one is a neutral. And if you do not specify, this is what you will get. Uh, that does not allow a good profile of the um, proximal humerus. Is probably not as important in an intact uh, humeral head, but with uh, an evolution or practice, this becomes quite relevant. 
uh, in the external rotation view, you can see the tuberosity in a better profile view. Uh, the tilted views, the 15 degrees up and the 30 degrees down, which I normally get, these are important to look at the AC joint as well as some of the spurs that may be visible on, on the cordon view, especially. The Y view or this scapular Y view, as it's called, it's too good to look at the acromial morphology and the spurs that arise from here, as well as may help localize the lesions. And you can trace out the humeral head. It helps to also look at whether the humeral head is in the right place in case of uh, dislocations. Continuing with the radiography, uh, the axillary view, it provides good view of the glenohumeral space. Uh, to look at the axis, uh, normally it's um, uh, it's um, anterior to the glenoid, and we commonly see that in arthritic shoulder uh, when there's glenoid erosion. That is usually a retroversion that is seen. You can also look at the osychromial. Look at the MRI scans. Now there are various sequences and different planes which one must be aware of. Uh, the typical sequences are coronal oblique T1 and T2, the sagittal oblique T2, and the axial T2 fat suppressed. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of what is this, but just to show what uh, one can see in these views. So in the MRI coronal oblique, one can go through from other sections into looking at the supra and the infraspinatus, and this is a good view to look at the tear and the degree of uh, retraction of the supra and infraspinatus tear. Also gives a good view of the subacrum in space, the ACJ, the superior labrum, as well as the biceps tendon as it comes off from the supraglenoid tubercle and goes into the uh, groove. So this is just a video on um, of the of a scan. So going through that, so this is from the front towards the back. You can see that's where is the tear of the tendon coming up into the view now again. Okay. You can see this is a fairly large tear. Uh, that's the belly of the supraspinatus, which looks pretty normal. The tear, although is um, full thickness and fairly large, extending uh, through a big area, but is not retracted. You can also see the glow in the ACJ, suggestive of degenerative changes. But it's vital that uh, this is clinically correlated as we know from various publications, including one by myself, that uh, MRI changes are present in more than 80% of patients over the age of uh, 30, even if they are asymptomatic. So it's why, so this is going towards the back and you can see here as the infraspinatus coming up forming the tendon and the infraspinatus muscle uh, tendon is intact. The sagittal oblique is used to look at uh, the fatty atrophy. Uh, it also can be seen on um, a CT scan. We've got a low classification, uh, depending on how much of this space is occupied by the muscle and what amount is fat. Normally, one would expect um, the patient uh, for the muscle to be above the horizontal line drawn between the acromion and the coracoid process. This is a video looking at the same patient, showing the tear as so going from lateral to medial. You can see this uh, tendon tear with some fluid on the humeral head. So you keep going medial, you can start to see the biceps tendon as it comes into the view. And then you should also see the muscle belly of the um, 
supraspinatus into that Y. This is the glenoid and the coracoid. That tells you this muscle bulk is quite good. In the axial sections, it's mainly to look for the supraspinatus, the biceps. Um, <clears throat> you can look for any loose bodies. Uh, and the subscapularis tendon, also a good view for looking at the glenohumeral joint, uh, whether there is any rupture. So just again, a short video of the um, is from the top. Again, you can start to see the glenohumeral joint coming into picture. You can sometimes see the supraspinatus tear. It's only in big tears coming at the level of the glenohumeral joint now. You can see that there is a lot of fluid here, abnormal signal in the front there and in there. So this, let's go forward. So this is looking as if this patient has got a fairly large subscapularis tear. The bicepital groove is empty. And this is the biceps tendon as it sublux medially possibly a part of the labral tear. And as you can see, as we go down further, this is the labral, uh, this is the lesser tuberosity with the biceps sitting there. This is the folded capsule and the rupture of the subscapularis. There are secondary changes on the humeral head, suggestive almost like a hill sacs lesion. So, this patient had a traumatic tear of the supraspinatus as well as subscapularis. So in patients who have um, history of fall, uh, one must be careful and look at that. Um, the role of ultrasound um, is important in the um, shoulder, uh, especially if you've got an experienced musculoskeletal um, radiologist, it helps a lot. Key thing <clears throat> is to know the anatomy, um, understand the basics of ultrasound scan. I'm not going to go into too much detail as it's beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, if you're going to undertake one, you should have a set protocol so that there is nothing missed. Generally, I tend to start off uh, with scanning the biceps brachii tendon and the line of the biceps, looking at the subscapularis and the long head of biceps for any subluxation or dislocation going across over to see the supraspinatus and the rotator interval and then assess the AC joint, the subacromial bursa and the uh, impingement dynamically. And this is where the issue with um, ultrasound arises as, um, as a clinician uh, I'm relying on um, another person to interpret and I'm making the diagnosis with their help. Can also look at intraspinatus. Uh, the labrum can be tricky, especially if it's a large patient. Uh, just a quick uh, example of why and is this is relevant as to who does the scan and how it's interpreted uh, is uh, a, on, when you start off using the ultrasound, the probe is held horizontally. And if the probe is uh, perpendicular to the tendon, then one gets a nice view of the tendon. If unfortunately the probe is held at a slight angle, then because of an isotropy, uh, it may appear hollow. Um, and the same thing applies on the other view as well. And hence the uh, ultrasound is very operator dependent. Looking at what investigations are useful for what pathology, such so for biceps and labral pathology, MR arthrogram, whether direct or indirect, is the uh, gold standard for cuff, depending on the age of the patient and uh, history and other bits and pieces, plain radiographs at least, followed by MRI or an ultrasound scan. I generally prefer MRI scan, as I can explain the images better to the patient. For the bony lesions, also um, 
uh, plane radiographs, CT plus minus MRI is useful. We look at specific pathologies uh, in stability, usually under the age of 30, onset often younger, most commonly under the age of 20. First dislocation is often traumatic. If it happens for the first time in an older age group, the pathology is completely different. ALPSA is the anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion, which is uh, similar to a bank cut tear, but it's an avulsion of the labrum and the periosteum of the inferior glenohumeral anterior inferior glenoid, uh, and is generally seen in um, young adults, teenagers, where um, it's not ossified yet. So it's just a video showing uh, MR on uh, a patient with a labral tear. So this is the axial scans going through um, and you can see So this is an axial scan on a patient with instability. And you can see here that there is a large hill sacs lesion with a lot of fluid in the shoulder joint. And the whole of the anteroperiosteal sleeve has uh, a burst. And this is the anterior inferior uh, periosteum where where it's peeled off at that edge. The same patient uh, looking at uh, coronal views. Sorry, this is a CT scan. Uh, now, looking at the CT scan of the same patient, you can see there is a fairly large hill sex lesion. And the glenoid bone, you can see, is fairly intact. So it shows that uh, this patient had more of a soft tissue, the uh, avulsion of the entry into a glenoid. And the 3D reconstruction of the same patient. We heard of this, heard of this term GLAD, uh, which stands for glenoid labrum articular disruption, which means that the joint surface is also involved and there is partial tear of the glenoid labrum that gets an articular cartilage defect or uh, something like that. And if it's of long standing, a patient can also have a loose body, commonly seen in young and physically active patients. Uh, look at the alternative bites of labral pathology, i.e. the slap. Type of lesion is commonly seen in a throwing athlete. It's very well described in the baseball players, especially the pitchers uh, in the US. Um, but in the UK, commonly seen in patients with, who do racket sports. Weight training, especially the ones who do uh, powerlifting or bench presses. Cricket. And the pathology is generally uh, when the patient's arm is abducted and accelerated in the throwing position. What it does, it does a microtrauma at the posterior superior and the posterior aspect of the glenoid where the humeral head punches uh, the soft tissue. And what that does is causes microtrauma to begin with, uh, and the patient starts to have pain. And because of that, the patient then develops um, inflammation and irritation, causing a syndrome called the GERD, the glenohumeral internal rotation deficit uh, syndrome, and described also as an internal impingement type of a problem. There are various features that one can see. Um, you can see some, uh, clinically, there is loss of internal rotation. 
more than 20 degrees loss is considered um, a tognomonic of um, GERD or internal impingement. And I'll show you a bit later how to assess that. Uh, there is posterior and posterior inferior capsular contracture. Often there is an associated peel back of the posterior superior labrum. Uh, the greater fibrosity and the uh, posterior superior glenoid labrum is where the effect is and is the commonest cause of the pain in throwers. And they may or may not have the classic signs of impingement. So apprehension tests may be positive, but generally not for instability, but it is for pain. And the same applies with the Job's maneuver. When you try and do that, they get pain in the back of the shoulder. Bait and test is a must uh, to rule out any hyperligament of laxity as they are likely to have, more likely to have this problem. So when we talk total arc of motion, they should be same in both shoulders and it measured at 90 degrees of abduction. So this is the same patient uh, seen um, supine and uh, in standing up positions. So you can see the external rotation on both the sides, this is the left shoulder, this is the right shoulder, more or less similar. The internal rotation, if you see in a standing position, uh, is same. But if you do the internal rotation test on supine or lying down position, you can see on the right hand side there is significant deficit compared to the horizontal. Now, this would not be picked up easily. Uh, if the patient was standing uh, because the scapula rotates. If I take you back to the previous x you can see the difference now on the right hand side. So when the patient is doing his right hand, you can see his uh, medial border of scapula becomes quite a lot prominent compared to when he does on the left side. So that should give you a hint, but it often can be subtle and can be missed. So I always perform uh, this in supine position, and I, oh, this is probably the only time when I do an assessment of a shoulder in supine position. So typically it would be a young male patient who gives history of overhead workout or sports is when with coming with the shoulder pain. And typically these patients respond very well to a capsular stretching. You may see a Benes lesion, but it's not common as you need to have the position of the uh, plane radiograph near about perfect to capture that. Uh, and it doesn't really add anything to further management. It just helps confirm the diagnosis. The MRI findings are more relevant. And generally, as I said in my first slide, the MRI or any investigation should only be ordered if it's going to impact your treatment. So when I see this, these patients for the first time, I generally just tend to send them for physiotherapy to start their capsular stretching. And uh, once they can get their movement back, vast majority of them settle down. If they're still persistent or cannot do uh, their rehabilitation, then I would do the uh, MRI scan. And this is the typical lesion. Can have a posterior labral tear, can have some cysts on the humeral head and possible partial articular surface tear of the cup as well. Um, just to finish off, um, Parsonage-Turner syndrome uh, is basically uh, not a tear, but can mimic a large tear. And I remember in my early days as a consultant, I had seen a patient uh, who had a minor trauma, presumed to be cup tear, and was put on a waiting list for a cup repair pending his MRI scan. And when I got on the day of the surgery, I looked at his MRI scan, it was quite remarkable that uh, there was no cuff tear and you could see changes in the muscle. So Parsonage-Turner uh, syndrome is idiopathic denervation of the shoulder musculature and often classed as brachial neuritis and can have more than one nerve that is involved, affects mainly the element of the brachial plexus or individual nerves related to immune but can be precipitated by trauma and the key thing is to um, be aware of it. Lastly let's look at some scenarios uh, on a 20 year old with recurrent dislocation. If this was a face-to-face -face or alive then we would have had an interactive um, 
uh, discussion about uh, reason for putting this is in a 20 year old with a return dislocation, uh, the chapis or chapis has got a very high risk of um, ongoing uh, instability and must, must investigate this uh, with an MRI scan. And then pending on um, the, the results or if there's a suspicion on plane radiograph, you may need to get a CT scan. Uh, another scenario is a 50 year old male with painful shoulder trauma. I think this is the one that I still find often missed in the community uh, because these are still treated as a standard cuff tear, i.e. start with physio and if not then injection and if not better then do the MRI scan. I think this is one group, not just males, any 50 uh, year old with a painful shoulder trauma should be treated with an urgent MRI scan. This should be akin to any acute tendon injuries and should follow the similar pathway. If there's one message that I would like to give from this talk, if you see a young patient with a traumatic or painful shoulder, then they should have an urgent shoulder consultation plus minus an MRI scan. If it's an atraumatic, sorry, I'm not trying to be sexist here, uh, what it is, that if it's an atraumatic, then you can manage them along the lines of conservative treatment initially, followed by investigation if required. In a 70 year old, you could argue just a simple plain radiograph to begin with, treat with steroids and um, physio, and depending on the response, you decide further management. Uh, last bit, one cannot leave out is the post-operative pain, and this can be a painful, painful experience. Why is that? Well, must remember that complication is part of life. Surgeons who do not have complication belong to two categories. One, either do not operate enough or not telling the truth. And equally, if you worry about complications before surgery, you've already lost. So I think the key is that yes, during your practice and my practice, I see patients with post-operative pain and they are difficult to manage for both reasons. One, you are, if it's your patient, there's a different feeling. If it's somebody else's, then it's a different feeling. Uh, they are difficult to you know, come to a conclusion. So it's a nightmare. Uh, patient can become a difficult patient. Surgeon becomes the bad doctor. If surgery is done by someone else, then it's easy to blame, but um, as a surgeon who has enough experience, one knows that it can happen to them as well. So rather than try to blame another person, it's useful to find the causes. The patient is there to get a resolution of the symptoms rather than uh, trying to blame on somebody. It's often a multifactorial uh, for the shoulder plane. So what do I do? Have a history, uh, look at the type of surgery, uh, as well as the underlying condition that has been treated. Often waiting helps, so too early in any shoulder surgery, unless there are very clear signs of something going very wrong. Certainly for the first three to four months, that one can wait unless there are acute signs of infection or CRPS. Uh, then it's a different story. Uh, do blood tests, including um, inflammatory markers. An ultrasound would be useful in this scenario because MRI is generally um, a bit difficult, but if you do an MRI, usually with a contrast and may be able to do some ultrasound aspiration and swabs and culture for fluid. Uh, this would be to do um, culture for uh, cutinobacterium uh, acnes, which is a common cell, but also a pathogen for shoulder problems and can be difficult uh, to isolate. The advice is to use the gram negative culture bottles and incubate for two weeks before giving a negative report. So thank you very much for your attention. Any questions, I'll try and reply, thank you.